Friends, in this journey of life, something wonderful happened to me. I got my Guru, Paramhansa, Swami Niranjanan and Saraswati. And we as a family got associated with the Bihar School of Yoga, which is in Munger, Bihar, a place so beautiful and serene that it moves you from within. Through four podcasts, I bring to you this joyous and happy world. Today, I would be in conversation with the most evolved human being I have ever met in 60 summers on this planet. He is Swami Niranjana Nanda Saraswati, who has transformed lives of millions. Born on 14 February 1960 in Rajnandgaon in Chhattisgarh state of India, Swamiji is a sannyasi by birth. He takes great pride in saying, that he has had the privilege of uh, spending his childhood with his guru, Swami Satyananda Saraswati. His guru named him Niranjan, the untainted one, which he truly is. Swamiji's life is a shining example of a devotion of a disciple towards his guru and his mandate. For four and a half decades, he tirelessly worked for towards taking yoga from door to door to shore to shore. Swamiji was given Paramahans Diksha in the year 1990. For decades, he has been undertaking arduous Panchagni Sadhana and has been conducting ancient yagyas for the benefit of humanity and Mother Earth. Government of India honored him and decorated him with the Padma Bhushan in the year 2017 for his contribution in the field of yoga. A magnetic personality, Swamiji is a source of immense wisdom and he is, in his presence, all feel joyous, be it the elderly or the children. He combines tradition and modernity with aplomb. I've had the privilege of being in touch with Swamiji since the year 2006 and in my meetings over the years with him lot has changed within me and I have also had the privilege of being in touch with the institutions associated with his guru and him namely the Bihar school of yoga, Rikhya Peet and the Sannyasa Peet. All these years I have found a very strong and palpable presence of Swami Satyanandaji in his words and actions. His twinkling eyes start to sparkle brighter when he speaks about his Guru. And at times when he is remembering him, I have found those eyes moist too. This dance between the Guru and the disciple to me is an enchanting joyous cosmic symphony. Fellow travelers, I want to open this cosmic window to you all in this conversation with Swamiji. Hari Om Swamiji. Hari Om Tatsat. Swamiji, my heart is full of joy at this opportunity to be able to speak to you and have this conversation. Let me begin with the beginning. Sure. What are your first memories of Paramhans Ji as a small child, when you were a small child? How did he used to look like, talk, his special presence, like we feel when we are in your presence? First of all, I would like to thank you for giving this opportunity to be in this podcast. And uh, what you have asked is actually something very intimate experience of my life. I have had the privilege to spend time with my Guru, right from the time of my birth till the time of his Mahasamadhi. See, so. And that is a 50-year period of Being continued physical, 
emotional, yeah. spiritual yeah. contact with him. With him. And when I recall my childhood and my association with my guru, Sri Swamiji, I've always felt very close to him. In fact, I would say with my recollections that from childhood I considered him to be my father, mother, guide, friend, supporter. Yes. In every respect, he was the center of my life yes. and definitely not my family. And my earliest memories go back when I was maybe one or two years old and I would play on his lap. I would hide under his dhotis. <laughs> I would uh, tickle him. <laughs> and he was also a very down-to-earth sannyasin right yes. from the yes. word go. Yes. He never displayed any of his achievements, attainments, and he never lived mm. the life of a Mandaleshwar or yes, yes. with pomp and splendor. Pomp and splendor. Rather, he was one with every person he came in contact with. Yes. And during his uh, Parivrajak time, when he was traveling across the nation, mm. he had stayed with affluent people and with poor people. Yes. So he was a sadhu of the masses. Yes. And yes. the sadhu of the masses had a message from higher powers yes. to make our life more beautiful, more purposeful. Oh, lovely. And in those days, he used to just uh, wander about on bullock carts. Really? On, uh, Horse carts. The horse carts. There used to be no cars at that no, time. Obviously, yes. Sometimes walking, sometimes on elephants, sometimes on different modes of transport, transport. available at that mm, time. Yes. And people used to wait for him to come. Uh -huh. And there used to be big excitement. When he would come, reach. When he would come. A commotion and then everybody welcome. And he would. Uh, meet with everyone yes from child to adult to elderly everyone yes and people felt that he was friend to all that's very special yes he was not seen as a sadhu, sadhu of uh, some caliber from whom you have to keep your distance mm, connected with everybody but he connected and people also connected connected back with him connected back, back with him back and uh, he used to spend his time in satsangs even playing with children yes. and uh, lived a very simple and natural life Lovely. So that was my impression, impression as right well. from day one of my life. Swamiji, I've heard you were a very naughty and a very curious child. <laughs> I know that you used to get under the top shirt of Paramahansji, Swami Satyanandji, and tickle him while he was you would give satsang. Yes, I used to do that. <laughs> and uh, you would take that. And the, he would tolerate me too. He would tolerate <laughs> you. <laughs> and uh, you would take out that cassette uh, of a cassette recorder, unspool it, and bring apart the alarm clocks to see what is yes. inside. Did Swamiji, your Guruji, did he scold you ever for it? No, he never scolded me for any mischief that <laughs> I did. <laughs> I remember the incident when I had opened a tape recorder yes. to see how it would function. Yes. And when I tried to put it back again, there yes. were four or five screws <laughs> left outside. <laughs> <laughs> and he saw that. Yes. And he did not say anything. Many years later, mm. in one satsang he mentioned. Oh, okay. 
that Swami Niranjan would open my tape recorders, <laughs> my 35 mm movie <laughs> projectors, projectors, and uh, cameras to Camera. see how they would function, <laughs> function. inside. But he also continued to say, I never scolded him or told him not to do. Mm -hmm. Because I realized that my one tape recorder was broken. Yes. Which was the material one which I can replace. But, but if I damage his <laughs> tape recorder <laughs> by getting Water. angry or telling him not to do this or that, that then I would not be able to repair that. <laughs> but what a, what a, what a insightful thing to say. Definitely. Swamiji. What a insightful Definitely. thing to say. Amazing. Swamiji, we are sitting in this bird ashram, beautiful lawns and garden and such things. But in early times, it would have been verdant and wild. And uh, life here would have been difficult and uh, tough. What was the routine in earlier times, Swamiji, and uh, what difficulties were faced? This year we are celebrating the Diamond Jubilee of Bihar School of Yoga, yes. along yes. with the birth centenary of Sri Swamiji. I am telling you this because it indicates that Bihar School of Yoga has had a journey of Six decades. 60 years, yes. yes. And the first two decades yes. were the decades of growing up. Right. And that time when Sri Swamiji had come to Munger for the very first time, it was a completely strange place. Huh. He did not know anybody here. Right. In fact, his uh, group yes. of devotees and disciples were in Bhagalpur, not in Munger. Not in Munger. Mm. But he liked to come to Munger because of its isolation from every other town. Mm, yes. And the northward flowing Ganga. Oh, yes. Yes. Uttar Vahini Ganga. Uttar Vahini Ganga. And he used to sit beside the Ganga and enjoy the peace and the solitude and from time to time do his sadhana. Yes. Then one of the landlords of the town yes. at that time, yes. Sri Kedarnath Goenka, Ji. saw Swamiji yes. and invited him okay. to come and stay at his place where today Paduka Darshan is right. existing. Yeah. And from there, Swamiji used to come to Ganga Darshan, to this place. Right. And do his meditation on a Chabutra. Okay. And that Chabutra is supposed to be an ancient Chabutra. It is here in this ashram. Here this in chabutra. this ashram. And here Sri Swamiji had many spiritual awakenings and experiences. Yes. And in one of the experiences he saw during his meditation, the Chabutra open up. Right. A white figure emerged from the Chabutra. Yes. And say two sentences. Right. This place will become the epicenter of global yogic renaissance. Okay. And second sentence was, yoga is the culture of tomorrow. And Sri Swamiji took this vision yes. as a mandate to take this forward. To take this forward. Yes. And Sri Swamiji already had mandate from his Guru Swami Shivananji yes. to spread yes. yoga from door to door yes. and shore to shore. Yes. So it was in Munger he realized when the spirit said, Yes. This will be the epicenter, epicenter. of Yogic Renaissance. Yeah. Sri Swamiji knew that his mission would begin here. Begin here. And in 1963, yes. Mr. Goenka yeah. gave a small room which used to be 
the ice factory of Mungir. Okay. It was a small room, 12 by 12 size. Okay. And that was the start First, of Bihar School Bihar of Yoga. Bihar School of Yoga from the ice factory room. Bihar School of Yoga was conceived in 1963 and inaugurated in 1964. Okay. Of course, that time there were no facilities of any kind. Indeed. We were about 10 sannyasins, 10 people who had come to live with our guru. Right, so. Not with intention to learn yoga or to teach yoga. Just to be with the guru. But our intention was just to spend our time with Mid our guru, Midam. be with our guru, learn from him. Not from, right. So we had no aspirations to yeah. become yoga teacher and we did not even know what yoga was. Right. We just wanted to be with our guru. With our guru. So we came. And those days, there were no rooms. We had to stay out, sleep oh. out. In the open. In the open, under trees. Hmm. And uh, for 20 years, yes. I did not know what a room was. For 20 years? For 20 years, I did not know what a room was. Hmm. Because we all lived in a communal space. Yeah, right, right. And uh, in the early days, people did not know what yoga was. There were many misconceptions about yoga. Yes. When people would look at us young people, <laughs> yes, they would taunt us by saying, why have you taken sannyas? Oh. You should go to home, okay. raise your family, get a, a job profession, yes. sannyasis for old people who okay. want God realization. Right. And there were very few takers for yoga. Initially, yes. Initially. In fact, I remember when for one month yoga training program, a charge of five rupees was fixed. Okay. Huh. That became a major issue for people that how can... How can you charge? You charge for teaching yoga. Yoga. And of course, they did not understand that an organization was developing. Developing that People also. were staying there. Yes. And for many, many years, we did not have anything to eat. To eat? To eat. Or to wear. Or to wear. Oh. Male sannyasins used to wear cowpin. Oh. Okay. Whether it was summer or winter or rain or anything. Oh. Female sannyasins were given a dhoti which they would tie around their neck. Neck. And that would be cover them, yeah. And that would cover their body. Yeah. And that was the only dress that we had for many, many years. As there was no money to buy anything. That's very difficult life, Swamiji. And then uh, even for food, we did not have money. Hmm. Many times I used to go with other sannyasins with a gunny bag, bora, on yeah. our shoulders to Mungir Market. Oh. And pick up the leaves of the vegetables thrown on the ground by hmm. the vendors. Okay. Or the rotten vegetables. Yes. Rejected. Rejected vegetables. Yes put them in the gunny bag, bring them to ashram, clean every leaf, yes. remove all the rotten parts, and then whatever and use the green part for our vegetable or soup. That's, that's very difficult time. And so there much. were times we did not have salt. No salt. So if somebody would give salt, that day used to be like a feast for a us. Feast. Oh. So we had our share of struggle in yes. the beginning. Yes, yes. And uh, that made us more strong and resilient. Resilient. And made us look at life from a different perspective. Mm. And uh, I would say that it was the most beautiful learning period 
of our life through these struggles that we faced. And it was happy. And we were joyous. We were never sad. We were never sad with that. No, we were always happy. Always happy. We were always happy. In this modern world, we are looking for happiness. People with everything mm. go around sad. Mm. With all these difficulties, mm. everyone was happy. I think when challenges come, people are happy. That's interesting. Yes, and when you accomplish yes. something, then that makes you even more happy. Even more happy. That's true, so much. So That's if we could get a huge piece of cabbage and make one katori of soup <laughs> from that <laughs> yes. leftover, yes. I mean, that used to make us more happy than in eating a full... Full spread of meal. Or spread of meal, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Very, very uh, challenging. And we learned terms. happiness with having the minimum. Mm. And I believe that is a very strong yogic point also. Yes. Because we seek for happiness by In accumulating. Accumulating things. A lot. Yes. But to be happy with a minimum. That's a very big. I yes. think it's the real life. That's real life. I think that is the real life. That's the real life. Amazing, Swamiji. Swamiji, you are a polymath and a polyglot. And it is said that Swami Satyananji <coughs> taught you through Yoga Nidra. Is it true? And were you aware that he was teaching you? When I came to Ashram finally, my age was six. Yes. And the only introduction to school I had was one day of kindergarten. One day. <laughs> After that, I did not go back saying, what will I do by learning Baba, Black Sheep, <laughs> have you any wool? I would prefer to sing bhajans and kirtans. Kirtans. And not learn Baba, Black Sheep. So Sun I never went Sun back. Sanyasi by birth. <laughs> so I never went back to kindergarten. <laughs> then, somehow my parents, they put me in school, but when they tested me in school, I qualified to go to class four. Okay. So I skipped one, the two, two three, three, and straight away went to class four. Four. Okay. And I was there for one year, and I was the smallest, youngest obviously, child obviously. at that time. And then, I finished class four. I got the letter from Sri Swamiji saying, if you want to come, you are welcome. Mm. And without waiting for my report card, you came. I came here to Munger. Munger. Here, in the early days, I used to live with Sri Swamiji mm. in his room. Mm. There was only one bed. Mm. So you sleep with him. And I would sleep with him. Yeah. And uh, at night, he would do some things to me, mm. which I realized later when he told. Okay. Because while he used to put me through yoga nidra, I had no awareness. I was fast asleep. Mm -hmm. Yes. But I was told by him that after taking me through the process of yoga nidra, he would read me a piece of a literature. Right. Some science, maybe something from Gita, maybe something from Ramayana, maybe something from biology, physiology, anatomy, yes. physics, maths, anything. Yes. And next day, he would give me the book from yes. which he had read. Read out. And when I used to read, the be. feeling used to be, I know this topic, I have read this somewhere before. So it's gone down during Yoga Nidra so to your In Yoga Nidra, it went to my subconscious. Right. So when I had the hard copy yes. in my hand, and it was not something that I was reading for the first time. Interesting. But I used to wonder, where have I read it? Yes. And then once I asked Swamiji, you know, many times when I read, I feel that I have read this thing somewhere. Yes. 
Why is that happening? Then he told me about Yoga Nidra. About Yoga Nidra. And Ashram also gave an opportunity to open up my brain. Right. Because people of all nationalities used to come. Yes. So I could talk to them about their culture, their country, yes, their yes, language, yes, yes. their belief, yeah, their absolutely. Yes. life. Yes. And that gave me in-depth understanding of different cultures and different types of people. Lovely. The world was coming to the you. The world was coming to me. To you. Yes. So even in the ashram, if yes. there was a French person, you were. I could learn French from French him. French from him. If there was a German person, I could learn German from him. So mm. my brain continued to expand and develop. Through Yoga Nidra. And through interactions. And through interactions. Interactions. And later on in my later periods, I found these two very valuable in my life. Yes. Swamiji, the Yoga Nidra, which Paramahansa Ji has given to the world, is relevant to all, be it children, student, homemaker, professional, spiritual seeker. And it is said that a Yoga Nidra with a resolve or sankalp changes the destiny of a human being. This is something which Swami Satyananji gave to the world. What is special about it? How does this work? It was in the decade of the 40s. Mm. That Sri Swamiji discovered the role of subconscious mind in human life. Right. And the story is something like this. When Sri Swami Satyananji was serving his guru in Shivananda Ashram. Yes. The room of Swami Satyananji used to be near one of the boundaries yes. of a Sanskrit school. Okay. Yes. So when Swami Satyananji would go to rest yes. after working during the day and for half of the night. Yes. At four o'clock, he would be in slumber. Yes. And at that time, the students of the Vedic school would start their chanting. In the morning, yes. Then, one day, these children came to Shivananda Ashram. Yes. On the occasion of Swami Shivananda's birthday. Okay. To chant the mantras. Okay. And when Swami Satyananji heard those mantras being chanted, yeah. he started to chant with them. Obviously, uh, he had heard them he in his slumber. Them. It was a very spontaneous thing for him to join in. Join in. To participate. Yes. You know, like when something is happening and you know you also join you in. You also join in. So yes. in that manner he participated. But he questioned himself that how did this happen? I've never heard the mantras before, but I, how, but can, I knew how can I chant? Yes. So he went to Swami Shivananji. Okay. And Swami Shivananji told him, Yes. Ki, when you are sleeping, the students are chanting, so. and they are being received by your subconscious mind, and your yes. subconscious mind is all powerful tool of life. Right. And even the modern scientists, they speak of the yes, power, of the, subconscious power of the subconscious mind. Yes, they do. And it was at that time that Sri Swamiji decided to explore and experiment with methods through which you could access the subconscious mind. Right. That's the beginning of Yoga and Nidra. And the Yoga Nidra, concept if of Yoga Nidra started at that point. Yes. Then. Uh, of course, the term Yoga Nidra is not new. Even everybody knows that yes. Narayana is practicing Yoga Nidra all the time. All the time, yes. But till now, Yoga Nidra was only a word. Yes. It was not known as a practice. Right, yes. 
It was just a word. It was just a word. A word. But what it is in actual life, yes. how it is practiced. Yes. yes, yes. And that discovery was made by Sri Swamiji that you go through this process, process of and body how. awareness, sound awareness, breath awareness, you access your mind, take the sankalp, go deeper, extend your awareness to the whole body, and like this, he developed 80 different stages of yoga nidra. Eight zero. Eight, Eight zero. Okay. And in our training, he made us do this different yoga nidras. Okay. And he used to say, yes, that yoga nidra, which will be of 40 minutes to one hour, is for physical relaxation. Right. Yoga nidra of two hours is for mental. Right. And yoga nidra of three hours is for psychic discoveries. Today, in the yes. world, people have copied yes, and yes. modified and adopted, adopted the first part of Yoga Nidra, which is relaxation. But that's not even 40 minutes. It's a very shallow copy, which I find in the world. I guess world. everybody has their style. Yes. But uh, the application of Yoga Nidra has been purely physical by people. Yes, yes. To achieve relaxation. Yes. But Swami Satyananji, has taken us from physical to Mental psychic to discoveries psychic. Yes. in Yoga Nidra. Yes. And we have also done, yes. practiced with him, yes. Yoga Nidra lasting three to four hours. Hours. So, it's a complete process, process. of not only relaxing, but mm. also rediscovering one's potentials of the yes. subconscious mind and of the psychic mind. Yes. And therefore, in the early days, Paramahansaji used to call Yoga Nidra the psychic sleep. Yes, yes, he did. I have read it in literature. He used to call it psychic sleep because it would allow you, the yes. final stages of Yoga Nidra would allow you to explore the and experience yes. the human psyche. Okay. But when it was used for relaxation. Yes. Then he called it sleepless sleep. Sleepless sleep. Yes. That you was can the sleep without state. going into that deep slumber. Deep sl slumber at the body level. Yes. And, and have body. full relaxation. Have full relaxation. So definitely, the discovery of uh, Yoga Nidra is our Gurudevs, and uh, people have adopted it according to their needs. Yes. 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 Swamiji. Uh, your guru sent you at a very tender young age uh, international travel and uh, you must have been one of those uh, sannyasins first batch who were in the forefront to cross Indian borders and take yoga uh, beyond into the world. Tell us something about uh, those times Swamiji, some anecdote, something educative, interesting of those times. They were very interesting times because very few Indians used to go abroad at that time. Yes. Maybe I think globally we were about 500 to maybe a thousand Indians who were outside, outside the country. Outside India. Hmm. And uh, anybody who was outside knew each other. Uh -huh. Yes. They must be knowing each other. They would be knowing each a other. A small group. Because it used to be a small a community. Small, small community. And even flight was not direct in those days. So you had to hop. It was a hopping flight, like from when I went to England for the first time. Yes. It was hopping from Bombay to Karachi, Karachi yes. to uh, Afghanistan. Right. Afghanistan to Iran. Okay. Iran to France. Number of short France flights. to England. Okay. So in this manner, it was a hopping flight. Mm, all right. And propeller planes. Problem planes. No right. jet planes. Ah, right. <laughs> so, so naturally there was the, yeah. time to travel. Yes. And uh, <clears throat> I remember that my first impression yes. 
when I came to England. Yes. It was at night, 12 okay. o'clock. Okay, at night. And uh, I was half asleep. Yes. Ah. So I did not register anything. Uh, right. I came to my room, straight away went to sleep. Uh, right. Next morning I wake up and it has snowed the night before. All white. So everything was white. Right. The leaves were white, the trees were white, the fences were white, the road was white. Your first snowfall. The garden was white, <laughs> the flowers were white. Right. So I go to Swamiji and ask him, you know, what type of country or place is this? <laughs> no here color. Everything is white, including people. <laughs> I don't see any color here. <laughs> so then he explained to me yeah. about uh, snow, the snow and, and seasons. The snow. <laughs> and that time, of course, my age was only 11, so everything was mm -hmm. a new exploration for me. Yes, yes, Swamiji. Yes. That's but it. I remember that uh, there was enough of self-confidence to survive alone in Europe, even at that age. The confidence of being, uh, the what you went through as a Correct. Uh, child, you went through in the Correct. ashram, the strength and resilience Correct. it gave. Correct. Correct. So I had no problem anywhere and um, I was able to quickly integrate myself with communities and with people yes. of different cultures, right. make them my friends, Lovely. and uh, have great time with them. Great, Swami. Swamiji, your coming back to India is an inspiration to all disciples. One call, phone call from your guru, and you left everything which you were doing in a jiffy and headed back home. I consciously use the word back home. You headed back home to your guru. And then you were made the president of Bihar School of Yoga. And you asked Swami Satyananji that he should stay back for a while and guide you. And he stayed back five years to guide you. Those five years would have been a great learning experience, educative experience. Tell us something about this. I got a telegram hmm. in the month of December hmm. from Sri Swamiji. At that time, I was living in America and uh, we were developing the yoga movement in America. Mm. I had just signed documents to acquire a piece of land to establish the ashram. Okay. And after signing the document, I come back to my ashram and mm. there is a telegram waiting. A telegram waiting. Return to India by 16th Jan positively. Okay. Assume pre presidentship on 19th. On 19, okay. This was the telegram. Right. I look at the calendar. It is 20th December. Yes. Christmas time. Christmas time. I call up my people and say, I've been recalled back to India, so we can't have the ashram. Yeah. So I'm returning the land to you. Searching throughout, I found one travel agent who was able to book me a flight. Back. Earliest flight was on 14th January. Oh. And <clears throat> I closed everything. We had three ashrams. Yes. I told people, I'm going, now you wind up. Yes. I left New York on 14th. Yeah. And I reached ashram on 16th evening. Yeah. Oh, yes. And then, of course, on 19th, Sri Swamiji gave me the responsibility of presidentship of BSY. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. And he said, now I'm free to go out. I finished my duty. Mm, duty. I'm free to live like a sannyasi. Yes. And fulfill the mandate of my guru for my sannyas life. For sannyas life, right. I had lived out of India with short visits in between, practically from the age of 11 to the age of 23. So 12 years I was totally out. out. Yes. And uh, my formative years were abroad. Yes. So my connect with Indians and Indian population oh, was and Indian less. Society and yes. culture ah. was lacking. Right. I was in India before till the age of 11. 11, but then for Then 12 there was years. a whole gap, gap till the yes, age of 23. Yes, and those are formative years, yes. So for that, for that re reason, I requested Paramahansaji to give me some time yeah. so that he could teach me yes. what I needed to learn. Right. And he agreed. And he cancelled his programs. He went for his last travels around the world. In 84, then he cancelled all his programs and he stayed here hmm. till 8888. Yes. When he finally left the ashram uh, as a wandering mendicant. Uh, yes. With Swami Satyasangananda. Yes. But from 83 to 88, that five year period. Yes. I call it the period of love. Really? Of a guru for a disciple. Oh, beautiful. And he gave me that time, he inspired me, he encouraged me, he taught me. Mm. And uh, when he felt confident that I was able to carry out things on my own, on. then one fine morning he said to me, prepare my bag, I'm leaving. Okay. And uh, the only thing he accepted was 108 rupees as token of respect from Bihar School of Yoga. And so he left the ashram. Everything he left. With two dhotis and 108 rupees, rupees given to him as dakshina. Right. Right. And it was a uh, a moment of inspiration and of, of course a difficult moment as well. Emotional. Emotionally, Emotionally difficult, difficult moment yeah. as well. Yes. To say once Guru walk away knowing that he is not going to return. Yes, Amit. But at the same time it was an inspiration to see the strength of character of an individual. Absolutely, yes. To be able who to could, walk away from everything. Who could just walk out. Yes. In one second, the person who used to fly first class on flights. Yes. Meet with all the presidents and prime ministers of the nations. Nation. Live in exalted accommodations. Yes. And today to see him simply walk out with two dhotis and 108 rupees like an unknown person was definitely emotionally difficult time but also very inspiring and fulfilling very inspiring and fulfilling also what a man what a man what a man yes. swamiji swami satyananji's mission his vision your tireless efforts led to the flourishing of yoga. And as you said, this place did become the epicenter of yoga. Everyone from all over the world has started thronging for quite some time to this mm. place. What, what led to this phenomenal growth, Swamiji? These, these years will go down as 
golden years in the history of yoga? Definitely they will. And the inspiration comes from Swami Shivananji to Sri Swamiji, who was totally focused and devoted to accomplish and fulfill the mandate yes. to propagate yoga from door to door and shore to shore from a very practical and scientific perspective. Yes. And in the time of Sri Swamiji, the focus was on yoga propagation. Yes. And for that, there were continuous tours mm. and travels throughout mm. the world, throughout the country, mm. in every state, in every city, in every village. And propagation work happened for 50 years. Yes. From 1963 to 2013. 13. The five decades were spent for the yogic propagation around the world. Yes. And because of its scientific and practical approach, non-sectarian and non-religious approach, yes. Satyananda Yoga or the Bihar Yoga was accepted in every country of the world, yes. whether they be Islamic countries or Christian countries. Christian countries. And people valued the teachings yes. of Swami Satyananda. Then, when the age of propagation was over, from no teachers, in 50 years there were mm. teachers in every street. Teaching yoga. Teaching yoga. Teaching yoga. So now, need was felt to deepen the understanding of yoga, explore yoga, and to understand what yogic lifestyle is. Yes. Mm. And our focus has been that. Mm. Yes. And today, Bihar School of Yoga is definitely a yoga center, a yoga institute for higher yogic education. Yes. And uh, we also have had the opportunity to establish the first yoga university recognized by UGC. Yeah. UGC, yes. In which we had for many years training in Department of Yoga Philosophy. Yes. Department of Yoga Psychology. Psychology, right. Department of Applied Yogic Science. Yes. And Department of Yoga Ecology. Very interesting. And yoga philosophy, everybody understands. Exactly, but applied part. But yoga psychology. Psychology. Is something which was developed by Bihar Yoga Bharti. Right. And it is the first example of the classical Indian psychological system of the past. Okay. And this syllabus was also adopted by other universities, universities in, in Bihar. In Bihar it was adopted. Like Nalanda Open University yes. adopted the yoga, yoga psychology along with... Yoga philosophy or... No, other. along with the modern psychology. Oh, modern psychology. They had this So they had as well. both oh, right. paths. Bhagalpur University had yoga psychology also along with... Normal psychology. Normal psychology. So like that. This concept of yoga psychology was also introduced by us. In fact, this would be a very pioneer thing. Uh, it is. Because, uh, it is very pioneer. It is very pioneer because psychology as such and having a yoga psychology steeped in uh, the subcontinent to India's tradition would be something which perhaps a lost with the other. Because I've never that. believed that such an ancient civilization had no means of dealing with emotional or mental difficulties, imbalances yes. and distractions. And it is a natural part of our culture. Yes. Psychology has been a natural part of our culture and also of yogic tradition. Of yogic tradition. Of Vedantic tradition, of Tantric tradition, of Sankhya tradition. Every tradition of this country speaks of 
psychology. Yogic psychology. Mind, yes, states, mind, mind, yes. and how to deal with it. How to deal In with fact, it. In fact, Yoga Vashist has a whole treatise on human psychology. Yes, yes. And, and we had lost it. We come back pioneering in this, the Bihar School of Yoga has brought it to the forefront again. That is our attempt to revive. To revive. Our Indian traditional values and culture. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yoga has become a medium through which it, can it be. has become possible. It has become possible. And same with the applied yoga. Yes. Because in this applied yoga, we taught yoga to the Indian Army. Yes. To Indian Railways. Yes. To prisons in Bihar. Yes. To different government undertakings, private undertakings like yes. Coal India, mm. BCCL, yes. BHEL, yes. ONGC, mm. IOC, SAIL, mm. SAIL. Yes. So many government departments, many private uh, industries, yes. government undertakings were exposed to the applied yoga. these different yogic practices, practices. to improve their, their performance Perform. and output. Interesting. And one of the outstanding results was found in Baroni refinery. Okay. For one year, Bihar yes. School of Yoga managed the human resource department yes. by remote control. I see, from here. From okay. here. Okay. And that year, the output had increased by 34%. 34%. The health of workers had improved and the medical expenditure had reduced. Had reduced. And uh, no conflict between unions and administration. Well, and the overall well-being was of the entire industry it, was has, elevated. Has gone up. Had gone up. What an interesting concept. Huh? So in the applied yogic science, we yeah. made the effort to bring yoga to different levels, levels of society and also to industries and private and government undertakings so that people can be benefited. People can be benefited by that. By that. So, Swamiji, I have observed that in a very gentle move, like an expert driver, you have shifted a gear and have you brought in yoga as lifestyle. In the process, you have actually increased the experiential depth of yoga and also the breadth that of yoga. Can you tell us more about this, Swamiji? Yoga as lifestyle. For me, since I have come to ashram at an early age, yes. Yoga has always been a lifestyle. It has never been a practice. It's never been a practice, yes. And the thoughts, the ideals of yoga are incorporated into our daily routines. Right. In fact, I would like to ask you a question here. Oh, yes. If you have applied it is in your life and profession. Can you explain that? And that will reflect your understanding or incorporation of yogic ideas in life. Swamiji, yes, I have applied it is. When I first came across it is, well, it was in a form of a song. Uh, serenity, tenacity, this and uh, I mean, I imagined uh, Swami Shivananda ji his huge frame singing this and people listening. But when I reflected on it, and I thought that how I can apply these it is in my life. So I examined in my profession. At that point of time, I was in the world of intelligence. So what is the it which I really need at this point of time? Out of all those it is, one it came up like this. It was adaptability. And this ET was very pertinent for me because as an intelligence officer, I had to interact with a tea vendor on the countryside yeah. or to the best of diplomats or the world leaders or everyone on the other end. 
In fact, Swamiji, I remember that once at night, around till 11, I was in a banquet wearing a proper suit. Dinner was being served. I was working for the country, talking to people. And just 16 hours later, I was here in the ashram doing Hari Om <laughs> and a different persona. Mm -hmm. So that was vanity mm -hmm. which I applied. Adaptability. Adaptability. There was another ET which I have applied. Mm -hmm. And that is Swamiji, when uh, I was heading the force called the Central Industrial Security Force, I was Director General. When I observed the force, I found that communication it, with the people at the ground level is lacking in the real sense. Because in the forces, everybody is taught to obey orders. But then it didn't have a, I felt it didn't have a soul. And I felt communication, a leader's communication should have something more in its content than just a communication. Again, I went back to the 80s and I found sincerity as a ET coming up. And in all my communications, I tried my best that when I communicate, I communicate with sincerity. Mm -hmm. And every time, so much, all through, I found that whenever I communicated, sometimes things are unpalatable. As a leader, you have to take those decisions. But they were understood, accepted, because they were talked up with sincerity. So this is my two ETs which mm. I have actually worked. Sure. And yes. why I'm referring to this, mm -hmm. Because this adaptation yes. is actually helping you better to be better in life. It is. It is. And this is integration. And that is the yogic lifestyle. That is yogic lifestyle. Yogic lifestyle is not meditating for X number of hours. Yes. yes. Yogic lifestyle is not sitting it in front of the clear. altar, yes. ringing yes. the bell and offering flowers. Yes. Yes. Or chanting mantras. Mantras. Yes. Yogic lifestyle is application of wisdom to make the moment most creative and positive. Application of wisdom to make the moment more creative and positive. positive. And Beautiful. that is the yogic lifestyle. And that's the yogic lifestyle. So therefore, one should not think of yogic lifestyle as totally different or alien from the normal, normal life that life. we live. Normal life. It is not a religious lifestyle. It's a, it's a Correct lifestyle. It's a, a, it's a correct lifestyle. Correct lifestyle. Yes. Which allows you to connect with the positive in you and with the creative, creative in you. Creative in you. So that you are a success at home. Yes. In profession or wherever you wherever engage you yourself. Wherever you are with yourself. Mm. Swamiji, I was here in the year 2013 when the World Yoga Convention took place. And I could, and in fact, everyone who was here could feel the presence of uh, your guru, Swami Satyananji, during that time. At that time, you started something very unique, which is perhaps the only type in the world and goes by the name of Satyam Yoga Prasad. Hmm. This institution, organization has the biggest and the most authentic literature in yoga in the world. And you ask the people who were visiting, the delegates in the con and those who participated in the convention to pick up as many number of books they mm. want. I, I saw people greedy for books at that point of time. Yeah, it was an interesting greed because sometimes they will read it. But Swamiji, my question to you is, was this another, you know, inspiration from the teachings of your guru? Yes, I would say yes. Hmm. He had always said that yoga and knowledge they should go. always be imparted free. Right. Imparted Initially, free. in order to establish, you may charge something. You may charge something. Yeah. Yes. But eventually, when you have enough resources, yes. Just open the doors of your heart and give them to them. And give it to them. Give it to them. And I felt that since 2013, yes. 
after having completed one chapter mm. and one run, yes, we were ready, yes, to go into the second level, yes, where the teaching, yes, of our parampara, yes, is made accessible and available to all without any thought of oh I have to buy, I don't buy have the buy. resources, mm, the yes, money, the yes. finances, yes. That's and that is part of Jnana Yajna, which was started by Swami Shivananji. Ji. And that was continued by Sri Swamiji. Yes. And although intention was there before, but formalization no. took place no. in 2013. So it's the continuation of the traditions and the Correct. teachings of the Gurus. Correct. It's a continuation. Correct. In fact, I'm, I'm now aware that at satyamyogprasad.net, on a click now, mm. everything is available. Mm. Everything is available. Correct. Yes. So people can just access it Correct. for free. And knowledge for sharing is so beautiful, mm. Swamiji. Mm. And one always learns. One always learns. Yes. One always learns. Mm. Swamiji, I see that on the banks of the Ganga, sannyas peat has come up. Is it another world's a dance between the guru and the disciple? I would say this is the Leela of our guru. Okay. In his time, Sri Swamiji established the yoga movement. Yes. And it became yoga-oriented yes. seva. Yes. When he renounced yes. Mungir yes. and established himself in Rikhya, mm -hmm. he established the teachings of Swami Shivaranji. Mungir is the mandate of Swami Shivaranji. Go and mm -hmm. propagate yoga door to door and show to show. Yes, yes. In Rikhya, he established the teachings of Swami Shivaranji. Serve, yes. love, give. Serve, love, give. Purify, be good, do good, meditate, realize. This is yes. the Ashtanga Yoga of Shivananji. Yes, yes. And he inspired the creation of the third. It is his mandate also, the Sanyas Pit. Yes. For maintaining the vibrancy of the sannyas or the spiritual tradition of this country yes. and also to work for exploring the heritage left behind to us by our ancestors yes the rishis yes. and also by contributing to the development of human society yes and also to inspire other sannyasins, other sannyasins too. to realize their sannyas path. Path, okay, yes. So for three reasons, the sannyas path was created, yes. inspired by Swamiji. Yes. Yes. In 2009, he gave that mandate to me and said, now this is what you have to do. Yes. So along with yoga, this sannyas path is up. another activity. Another activity has come up. Swamiji, you are undertaking very ancient yagyas here. I think such yagyas which have not been done for centuries. Tell us something about that, Swamiji. Our ancestors used mm. to do a lot to create a balance between mm. individual, the nature, mm. the universe, mm, yes. and it is all reflected in their teachings, in their lifestyle, and in the rituals they used to follow. Of course, in this age, people have forgotten yes. the parampara which was established in Satya Yoga or Treta Yoga Teta or Dvapar Yoga. Yoga. Until the time of Krishna, the Dvapar Yoga. Yes. The focus on culture and lifestyle was very important. Right. Rishis used to focus on culture. Right. 
and kings used to focus on lifestyle Life for the society. Life of the society, right. The benevolent ones. Right, uh -huh. benevolent ones, of course, uh -huh. of course. And uh, there used to be prosperity. Yes. There used to be strength. Yes. Confidence yes. in the society. Uh, yes, yes. Because everything was secure. Yeah, it was a good mix. It the was culture a good mix. as well as the king, a benevolent king yeah. protecting. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. And in that period, a lot was given by the sages who explored how to make our climate conducive to our life and growth of grains. Okay, yes. That Vajpayee Soma Yagya yes. is now forgotten. Yes. And there are very few people, maybe 50 families in India today, right. who know this Yagya. Okay. After them, nobody will know the Yagya. It will be lost. It will be lost. We need to revive that. So that Yagya was performed. Yes. And it did have an impact. It did have. On weather. Yes. As we noticed and recorded right. for one year. Okay. Then uh, there were other yagyas to invoke the cosmic powers. Yes. To overcome human limitations. Yes. And even those yagyas were performed, which are Sudarshan yagya mm -hmm. or. Um, Pashupatastra Yagya, yes. Brahmastra Yagya, Naranastra Yagya. Yes. People, when they read mythology, they think of them as weapons. Yes. Which they destroy. Do. To destroy, yes, yes. But the mantras are used for removing the barriers which restrict your spiritual development. So they destroy the barriers actually. So it's and to destroy the barriers. Barriers, yes. For example, Pashupatastra yes. was used by Shiva yes. to destroy the three satellites. Right. Lauha Nagar, hmm. Hmm. Chandi Nagar, Swarna Nagar. Yes, yes. Which were demonical. Yes, demonical, yes. Mm -hmm. But now those three Purs, Tripur. Yeah. They, they are represented in our body as Brahma Granthi, Vishnu Granthi, Granthi Rudra Granthi. Rudra Granthi. And they have to be pierced. Pierced? It's, it's a part of evolving yourself. It is part of evolving oneself. In oneself. So the mantras are used to pierce the three Granthis. Granthis, yes. Same thing with the other man uh, other uh, havans Yag or havans yagyas. Yagyas. Brahmastra people say it's atomic, but Brahmastra is to still the mind. When everything becomes still, there is no agitation. Yes. Then that is Brahmastra. When everything becomes still, yeah. no agitation, that is Brahmastra. Jab sab sthir ho jai. Sthir ho jai. Okay. But the general conception is just the opposite. Correct. Just Correct. the opposite. Because we think in terms of the material. Material world. Id ideas. Yes, and yes. This is a weapon to destroy and to rule, to govern. And, and things external. And it is external. Things external. Of course, it did have an external dimension. Also. But the focus for yogis yes. was always internal. Was always internal. And focus for kings was, was always external. And, and, and for the society. Yeah. Yogis used to keep the arms, not kings. Yogis used to keep their arms. Hmm. And in times of need, they used to? They used to give their arms to kings to use. Yes. To win the war. To win and the then war. return the arms again. So, Lord Krishna so, was a yogi. So, you can say that uh, yogis were members of DRDO. <laughs> yes. Yes. And they, they used to make the arms. Arms. Give them in the times of need. And, then take, them and then take it back take them back. And they fulfilled two purposes, the external and the internal. And the internal. So our focus mm. has been the internal. Internal. Maybe some of that may use it for external, <laughs> but our focus <laughs> is for, for the internal. This understanding 
yes. of revival is yes. internal, internal and spiritual. Swamiji, uh, Munger Yoga Symposium, the first one was held in 2018 and the second one uh, concluded recently. Serious yoga practitioners from all over the world came and participated in it. What, what's the content and purpose of these symposiums? To raise the awareness of yoga, knowledge of yoga, intent of yoga, and application of yoga today, how it can be applied in our situation and time today. Because yoga has always been an evolving subject. Today, people have confined it to the physical dimension only. But prior to the year 2000, yoga every decade was identified with a purpose. Yes. For example, yoga of 80s was yoga of meditation. Of 80s was yoga of meditation. So across the world, people, people were learning yes. about pratyahar, yes. learning about dharana, yes. learning about dhyana, yeah. learning about how to manage the mental behavior. Yes. So the whole focus was the mind. Right. In 70s, yoga was for stress management. Right. So it became part of the industrial culture. Yes. Private and uh, government, government undertakings. As well. Yes. 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 And people were able to manage their stress levels, anxiety levels. Yes. Increase their output, creativity, yes. production, yes. find yes. their inner peace, joy, happiness. Yeah. So there was a target. There was a focus. Focus. In 60s, it was body right. building. Building, yes. To look good, be good. To feel good, to look good. Look good. To be vibrant, to yes. glow. To glow, yes. And like this, every decade, there was a focus of yoga teaching. Teaching, yes. But then, from 2000 onwards, uh, prior to this, also discoveries psychic discoveries have happened. Okay. Lot of psychic discoveries like uh, can you improve telepathy, clairvoyance, clairaudience yes. through yoga? Yes. And in Russia they even tried military application of telepathy and clairvoyance and clairaudience. Yes, they did. They did try an experiment. Yeah. So also America, Europe, yeah. Russia. Yes. There was a rush to explore Yes. The psychic dimension of life. Right. And how those extrasensory perceptions can be utilized. Yes. But of course, their purpose was application on the battlefield. Yes, yes. Not for transcendence, transcendence of the self. or for internal evolve. But nevertheless, an effort was made to investigate and the, to understand. To understand this. But then after 2000, as number of teachers increased exponentially into yes. millions. Yes, yes. The focus of yoga for each decade was lost and everybody started Everything. using yoga for self-gain. Right. And therefore, today yoga has become only physical. Yes. Throughout the globe. And part commercial. Part commercial and part physical. And physical. But the other components of yoga, yes. which deal with mind, and I believe mind is going to be the next big challenge, especially after the advent of uh, social media. Yes. And the epidemic of corona. Yes. People are facing a lot of mental turmoils. Yes. And mental imbalances and illnesses which even the psychoanalysts and psychiatrists around the globe are saying that mental health is going to be the next challenge in the coming decade. Yes, that is true, Swamiji, this is what they are saying. And for this reason, the expositions of symposium mm. become very important and vital for yoga teachers 
they'll take it out in the world to understand yes. how these yogic principles and practices can help manage yes. our psycho-emotional problems, yes. mental problems, mm. and to again find that clarity, relaxation, and creativity. Mm. That's very interesting. And in this symposium too, yes. the whole focus was on how one can treat different expressions of mind. mind. That's very interesting. Swamiji, in this world full of conflict, violence, social media, too much connectivity, too much technology, my one last question to you, what would be your and your Guru's message to the world? I know what my Guru would say. He would say, give yoga a chance in your life. Amen. And I know what I would say. Yes, Swami. I would say, practice digital fasting at least one day per week. Oh, <laughs> Stay away from your mobile. Yes. Don't look at the social media things. Mm -hmm. Yes. Don't open your TV. Yes. Set top box. <laughs> Just sit out in the garden with a glass of juice and a book and a magazine. Yes, at least and once a week. Once a week. Yes. Just go back to the life you lived before social media came into existence. Have a taste of it. And enjoy it. The enjoy day. it. Fellow travelers, we were just listening to Swamiji and his uh, life with his guru. I had begun by saying that I want to open this window of cosmic dance between a guru and a disciple to you. But during my conversation, I really could not make out at times who was speaking. Was Swamiji speaking? Or was his guru speaking? I found in him not only a dance, a total merger with his guru. And yes, at a mundane level, in the beginning I had said that whenever I have come here, and I've come here many times, something within me has changed. What has changed? Well, I have become more giving, more loving, and more compassionate, more empathetic. I'll also share that one of the earlier statements of Swamiji when I had first met him has stayed with me and helped me a lot in life. And I quote, there are no miracles in this life. The only miracle is to stand on your two feet and make intelligent choices. So whenever life has thrown a curveball at me, I have found my willpower sagging, tenacity giving way, I have stepped back and heard these this voice of Swamiji coming to me, taking rational choices and moved ahead. And yes, Swamiji, thank you so much for this conversation. I'm not only honored, this will go as highest point in my life. Thank you for and your... I hope all the viewers practice digital fasting and give yoga a chance in life. If they practice digital fasting, they won't see your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> After seeing my podcast. After seeing the podcast. Sure. Yes. And thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity to share some time with you. I'm honored, Swamiji, humbled, and truly, truly inspired by your presence and the conversation. Thank you, Swamiji. Thank you very much. Hari Om, Om. Sir.